everybody is overdoing it. All institutes are overdoing it, and it it makes people kind of uh, lose interest in the in the meetings. Yeah, it, in past we try to reach the people from abroad, United States, and we would invite them to Turkey, and they would come here, and all the participants would participate there. I remember about ten years ago. Remember Howard Gardner, Gardner. Multiple yeah, intelligence guess. theory. He was Correct. here, I think. Yeah, he was here 10 years ago. And I think people had to pay. I remember $100 for participation as well. But here we are free. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's no, okay. I, I, no, I usually uh, present in international conferences. And you no, know, it would cost me something like between five to $10,000. I know, I can imagine. Yeah. yeah, but but now you're sitting here and giving lectures to everywhere in the world and and at no cost. So uh -huh. people are yeah people are overdoing it. I think at this moment there are five six webinars at the same time. I see. Yeah, and also I think people have a chance to watch the video after the conference as well. That is correct. Yeah, that yeah. Correct that, too. That's why yeah. they feel that if I can't attend at the right time, I can watch it later on. They think so. True. Very true. Uh, Anyway. Shall we start? Yeah, please. Okay. Okay. Welcome back. Now I'm extremely delighted to pronounce the keynote speaker of this session, Professor Dr. Hussein Farhadi from Yedi Tepe University. The title of his speech is Integrated Pedagogy in EFL Education. But first, let me give some details about Professor Farhadi's biography. Hussein Farhadi is a professor of applied linguistics who received his MA in TESOL and PhD in applied linguistics from UCLA in 1978, uh, 1978 and 1980, respectively. His major area of interest is research on various aspects of language testing and assessment. He has taught courses on language testing, research methods, and ESP at the MA and PhD levels for the last four decades in Iran Canada, Armenia, and USA. He has also presented papers in national and international conferences and has widely published on the issues related to language testing. He has published more than 10 books and 50 articles <clears throat> on various topics in applied linguistics in general and in language assessment in particular. He has directed MA programs in TEFL, two nationwide research projects on EFL, EAP, test development and test validation projects in Iran and other places in the world. He has supervised over 60 MA and PhD theses, and he also directed several. Since 2013, he has been a faculty member of the ELT department at Yeditepe University in Istanbul, Turkey. Now, I would like to give the floor to Professor Farhadi to deliver his speech. Thank you. Thank you so very much. Uh, let me see if I can share my screen here. I'm just trying to Let me see. Okay. Sorry. Okay. Uh, do you see my screen? Yes, we can. All right. But if you press F5, it will be better, I think. To, to enlarge it, right? Yes. No, I will. Is it okay now? Yes. Thank you. Okay. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank Congress organizers for giving me a chance to share my thoughts and uh, perceptions about integrated uh, pedagogy in the EFL context. I believe it is an international conference and 
I hope uh, I would shed some light on issues that are pressing today the field. Uh, thank you for your introduction. And uh, the purpose of my talk or the purposes, I have three things in mind. Uh, I would like to give an overview of three major uh, dimensions of EFL pedagogy. As everybody knows, the field is in an ongoing state of change. And these changes are in theoretical, practical, and contextual areas. I would like to explain how we could integrate these changes in EFL pedagogy. And also, I'll suggest some tasks that would enhance learning in online instruction. Now, first, I would like to contextualize the, the uh, EFL teaching. And of course, it is not an EFL specific. It applies almost to all areas. As, as teachers, we usually teach, we expect someone will hopefully learn. To claim for learning, we need evidence. To provide evidence, we need some sort of testing. And based on the test results, we make a decision on the learner's life. The direction and movement seems very straight, but in fact, it is very complex, complicated, and abstract. And not EFL exclusive. It, it applies to all fields, but I will focus on uh, EFL. This Inter interrelation of all these steps I just showed you in the previous slide. The process starts with teaching, hopefully learning. We need to show evidence by testing and we make a decision. But that is not really the whole point. As we know, teaching is in constant change. Learning, following teaching changes, the meaning, the conceptualization, the process, and also testing, following these changes in teaching and learning change. Therefore, the quality of our decision should change. And these changes are coming from different fields. For example, we face challenges from language factors. What is language? How it is defined in different periods of time, beginning with traditional definitions up to present definitions. Then we have challenges from psychometrics or measurement factors in old days we were very handicapped in evaluating and measuring the abilities we did not see. And also we have changes in the context, the context of teaching. Especially in the last couple of years, we have had a tremendous amount of shift from face to face into online education due to COVID-19. All these changes interact all these changes push one another and when they get recording in progress when when they get to the point of implementation then these changes apply to teaching when it applies to teaching it definitely applies to learning when it applies to learning it definitely applies to testing and then the decision we make and here we have a poor guy called teacher, okay, taking all these responsibilities with the least probably authority. And this 
interaction movement has made great influence in our profession. Now, if these changes, we want to talk about these changes, I can divide these changes into two main eras. In one era, up to 2000 probably, we were all in the, uh, in the um, realm of product of learning. We were interested in the product of learning. What people knew, what people can say, what people can write, we would pay attention to what they can produce. And no matter what theory they followed, they were all product oriented. And uh, the focus was on the product of stored knowledge. Attention was not paid to how this knowledge is stored, whether it is in the area of acquisition or in the area of learning, whether it is uh, sort of applicable to the real life or not. And of course, uh, since they were trying to be very scientific, uh, psychometric principles, like when you were talking about tests, you would talk about uh, high reliability, validity, and psychometric principles dominated the field. And they were all high stakes, proficiency tests, placement tests, didn't make much of difference, midterms or finals. But then the process changed. We moved into process of learning. The focus shifted from product to the process of instruction. Learners needed to get involved in many cognitive and metacognitive activities to learn. Learning was not just transmitting information from teacher to the learner and memorizing it and storing it. Learners needed to develop a sense of achievement. When someone learns, that person should have a sense of achievement, self-confidence, self-regulation, and autonomy. These are the movements we have started in the process-oriented era. And the changes, of course, influence all fields, but I will focus on testing part. With the changes of focus from product to process, definition of testing changed because we wanted to avoid negative washback. Usually, uh, high stakes tests pr produce negative washback, and students learn in order to do better on the test. And that is what we call uh, test driven instruction. Instruction is based on not learning, but how I can boost students' score on a test. Also, in testing, we ignore all organizations. It is kind of top down process. TOEFL decides what to do, Michigan decides what to do, YUK decides what to do. It is from top to bottom, not from bottom up. And also in this system, students, especially learners, were all ignored because we did not believe, by we, I mean the field, did not believe that the students have developed the ability to assess themselves, to assess their peers. We did not count students in our assessment process. And to, to get rid of all these disadvantages, People did not have any choice, so they said, okay, we are going to use the word assessment because assessment is a more comprehensive term than testing. So assessment replied, replaced testing. The same thing happened in learning. This is something like 100 years ago. They say, uh, Dewey says, education is not an affair of telling or being told, but an active and constructive process. It means that passive learners would not have sustainable learning. And this means that learning is highly intellectual process that occurs when learners are involved in many cognitive and metacognitive activities to get a sense of self-achievement and self-confidence, and of course, self-regulation and autonomy. This is the new meaning or new definition of of learning and we needed to accommodate it. Now learning according to this theory involves not getting information from the teacher and storing it, but involves 
many, many activities. One is problem solving. One of the strategies to learn is problem solving. The other one, organizing, organizing the information, explaining, to be able to explain, not, not give back memorized information, but explain. Thinking, which is, uh, to my knowledge, within the last, I mean, decades, thinking was out of our instruction. We did not ask students to think about what they hear, what they, what they read. That is what people are talking about, critical thinking, but they never do it. Analyzing, to have the ability to analyze the information, transform the information. It means that you get information, you transform it and make it available to you when you want to use in the community in your real life context. Predicting is another strategy that in learning happens. What is next? What is before? Exploring, researching, which is very absent probably, has been very absent in many educational systems. Applying, to be able to apply the, the, the knowledge into the real life activities. Constructing, to create, construct new knowledge based on information you obtain. Negotiate, negotiation of meaning is very popular in our field, but negotiation is one of the basic techniques or strategies of learning. Sharing. There is no secret. Teachers, learners, authorities should not keep things secret for them. It is, it is something that should be shared with everybody. Creating and eventually assessing. This assessing is different from our assessment. Here is the learner who uses assessment in order to assess his own learning, her own learning, the processes he's gone through. This complex interrelationship of all these strategies makes learning possible. Now, in the context of uh, testing change, the context of learning change, and context of teaching change, because uh, COVID-19 uh, changed the world in many respects, a total of 1,580 million people, 94% of the student body in the world was affected. It forced instruction to online system with weak technological infrastructure and unprepared teachers and learners. This is the report by the United Nations just came out. The main problems, access to technology, technological knowledge of teachers and learners, we were not prepared for it. Changes in the emotions, sadness, anxiety, fear, confidence, and anger. These are all overwhelmed the learners. Learners who were in communication, contact with one another, with teacher. All of a sudden, everybody was in prison in their room, and they got depressed, they got sad, they lost a motivation. So many, many negative psychological effects. So you see, in, 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 in testing, we changed, in learning, we changed, and in uh, context, we changed. All these changes pushed us to find solutions to the problems. And also, when we moved into, into online system, all teachers were concerned about the reliability and validity of their assessments. They were all scared of students will cheat, students will not do the, do, do the job. I mean, this created a lot of chaos between teachers and students in online situation. That is why teachers move towards loading the students with more and more work, assuming that if they give them more assignments, they would learn better. So these changes, highlights, I would like just to mention, learning changed from storing knowledge by memory to an active dynamic process. Teaching moved from transmitting information to helping learners to transform information. 
testing changed from traditional product oriented to process oriented assessment. Teachers role changed from delivering information to constructing information with the help of students. Students role changed from passive receiver to constructing through cooperation and collaboration. The context changed from face-to-face -to, -face to online instruction, instruction. See, all of a sudden, we were in the middle of all changes at the same time, and, and we lost control. So we needed to accommodate all these changes. In assessment, probably, we moved very fast, and new terms came out, like assessment for uh, performance assessment, authentic assessment, alternative, formative, summative, classroom, just mushroomed all these words by adding an assessment. In fact, most of them were not really assessment. They just called it assessment. For example, performance, ass performance assessment is assessment. It is, it is like testing. There is no indications of changes in the process. But the term learning oriented assessment has been widely used in, in the field to encapsulate all these types of assessment. When you are in the area of learning oriented assessment, you are covering almost all those developments in one shot. Now, integrated pedagogy in, in LOA context, how it works in, in LOA, To cope with all these changes, we created a framework. In this framework, teaching, learning, and assessment are designed with the centrality of learner, learning processes, and learning outcomes. So the focus of what we do in class should focus on learners, learning processes, and learning outcomes. Number two, engaging students with criteria for quality for their own and peers' work or performance. And number three, providing feedback, which is extremely important, providing feedback in a timely manner and forward looking or feed forward so as to support current and the future student learning. This is one of the key uh, points in LOA, learning oriented assessment, that feedback in a timely manner. And actually right now there is research going on on feedback literacy of our teachers, how much they know about types of literacy, ways of presenting or delivering um, feedback, how to follow it up and change it into feed forward. It is a new area opening in the field. And this kind of pedagogy requires a systematic and dynamic relationship between teaching, learning, and assessment. We cannot, at the beginning, we thought that one comes after the other. But now, it is a cyclic system that all influence one another. For example, a pleasant consequence of these changes that we now are focusing on is that we moved from linear and discrete system of instruction into an integrated and cyclic system of instruction. What does it mean? In linear, we have teaching, then we have learning, then we have testing. So there is a linear relationship between them. But in integrated system, we have teaching, partially integrated with learn, learning, partially integrated with assessment, and they are all in contrast to linear relationship between teaching, learning, and testing compared to integrated and cyclic relationship. They're all in one circle and they are interrelated. Teaching uh, feeds learning, learning feeds assessment, assessment feeds teaching, and this is an, a cycle. It is not that teaching is different from assessment. Teaching should be done here. Assessment should be done here. Assessment, teaching, and learning are 
quite integrated, and that's what we call integrated pedagogy. Now, I would like to uh, just show you that what I mean by feedback, feed forward, what we call feedback loop. Uh, students do the work individually, then share it with pair or a group members, then with other works with other individuals, then pairs and groups to get feedback. So this is the first step of getting feedback, pair feedback or group feedback. Then based on the feedback, the student or the learner makes necessary modifications. And if they do not agree, they do negotiate. They talk to one another to see whether the feedback is applicable or not. Then they send the original draft, peer feedback, and the revised draft of, of, of the work to the instructor. Instructor provides further feedback and requires revision. This feedback loop usually takes more than a few weeks. And the significant outcome of this process from student to student, back to student, from student to teacher, back to student, and finally to teacher for grading. The hidden agenda here is that learning ha happens. Through these processes, students unknowingly, they are not conscious of, they are in the loop of learning, but they learn because they go through this process of feedback loop. I highly recommend, it is crucial in all kinds of teaching, now, some of the tasks I use in my LOA classes in online instruction. For example, students' reflection. In English classes, a student's reflection can work as a, as a beautiful device to improve students' learning if it goes through the feedback loop. Crucial, giving feedback and allowing them to improve their assignments for grading. You do not grade assignments at the beginning. You let them go through the feedback loop because they know they're going to be graded, so they try very hard to improve their work, and this means learning. Information on rubrics. Students should clearly know what they are expected to do. It is no secret. It is not something to squeeze the students. It is not something that to catch students. It is something we need to give students to, to, for them to understand what we expect from them and how we are going to evaluate their work. Peer and self-assessment, extremely helpful for learning. Collaborative assessment, wonderful task. Ask your students to help you in developing assessment techniques. See, if you, have, you are teaching a particular lesson in a particular class, ask students to send you some items, test items of any type, multiple choice, fill in the blank, that doesn't matter. But you see, the, the underlying purpose of this work is that in order to develop an item on a, on a context, you need to definitely study and learn that context, which is the problem with most of our classes where students come to class without reading, without preparing themselves, but this would push them indirectly to read and learn the materials. Pair and group projects, very helpful. In, in, in Turkey's context, probably in the last few years, I have examined from my students. At the beginning of the term, they say, I hate group work. I don't want to do group work because members of the groups do not do their share. Everything is on me, et cetera, et cetera. But at the end of the term, they say, their reflections say, I didn't know how beautiful this group work is because I learned a lot from my peers and my group members. We need just to be, to be sort of pushing them towards right context of learning. Responsibility of, of, of the stakeholders. Implementing this kind of program is not easy. 
it requires the co cooperation of all stakeholders. It is not only teacher or student. Learners are responsible. We need to change them from passive receivers to active learners. Communities. We need to educate communities to move from quantity to quality, to move from great score-oriented community towards learning how much they learned, not what they got in the, in the test. If you get 90, you will be blamed. You should get 100. We need to help them understand that 100 does not mean anything if it is not backed up by learning. This is a very important responsibility of authorities. Government should plan and support. Government should plan and take this great fear and stress of the shoulders of the teachers and learners. They should pay attention what students are capable and are able to do after the course. Teacher education uh, programs, they need to create, prepare, and train competent teachers. Teachers who would understand the process of learning and would transfer and transmit to the students. And teachers, the heart and the brain of education, okay? We need teachers' professionalism. Professionalism does not mean only professional knowledge. We push teachers to develop professional knowledge. Of course, it is necessary, but it is not all professionalism. We need to, to go through professionalism in their financial status, in their social status, in their lifestyle. All these uh, dimensions of life of the teachers should be professional. It's like professional football. It is not just the money. It is this lifestyle of professionalism. Teachers should be given more attention, should be given more sort of uh, support from the authorities. And that's not easy, it takes time, okay? Now, just only show you how, what teachers are responsible. They should share class criteria with learners, involve students in discussion, engage learners in self and peer assessment, put learners in the feedback loop, design assessment tasks as learning tasks, announce multiple stages of completion for assignment, assign the grade at the last step. And, and you see, all these, if you have 50 students in your class, 40 students in your class, it's gonna be an impossible task. That's why I said all stakeholders should get together and pull this on in order to make education and in general, and EFL, con EFL in particular, more useful and helpful. That is why after seven, eight years of, of in English instruction, we are not happy with our students' achievement because we are not doing the right things with our students, okay? Now, accomplishments with LOE, what we will accomplish if we use learning-oriented assessment? It encouraged self and peer assessment. It enhanced group cooperation that helps learning, learning from one another. It improved self-regulations. Students start beginning uh, self-regulation, understanding what to do when and where. Engage students in the course without any overt pressure. You know, you put them in the context that they will study the materials, they would do the assignments without putting overt pressure. Minimize the extent of academic dishonesty to almost zero. I did not have any case of academic dishonesty among students in my online system because there is not one assignment. There are different assignments in different times. They may get help from one person for one assignment, but they cannot continue hiring a couple of people to help them in all the assignments and all stages. Remove the stress of tests and exams from students. Remove the need for midterms and finals. We don't have to tie the lives of our students to midterm and finals. What if I got sick on the finals? What if I got, I got, I got stomach ache when I was taking finals? This is playing with the lives of of our students. We should give them ample 
multiple opportunities to show their abilities. And I am fairly confident that it would work for many teachers in many fields, in many contexts, and for many learners in a pleasant manner. There won't be any pressure. There won't be any bad times. And I thank you all. I will take questions if there is any. OK, uh, Professor Farhadi, thank you very much. Can you hear me? Yes, yes. All right. Uh, first of all, let me thank you for sharing your fruitful information with us and with our participants. It was a really great honor for us to see in our Congress. So uh, can I ask you just a final question? You know, maybe some other person would ask. Uh, I know that you are interested in, your expertise is, is in testing, right? So, Say it again, please. Uh, I mean, you are, I mean, your expertise field of study is testing. Am I right? right? Testing and evaluation. Mm -hmm. So how do you see the place of testing and evaluation in the post-COVID era? You know what I yeah. mean? <laughs> OK, um, I, I got it. Thank uh, you. Thank since you. I, since I, don't, I don't recommend the testing system, which is which most people have have perception of it, that the teacher comes in, gives a paper, the students uh, perform, et cetera, et cetera. Since I am one of the supporters and actually um, uh, the person who is publicizing learning oriented assessment, I think testing is no more different from teaching. I think testing is no more different from learning. I think they are integrated when you are teaching. In fact, if, if your teaching is based on the process of learning, at the same time, you are assessing, at the same time, you are checking students' learning. When you give feedback, like an example is portfolio assessment. In portfolio assessment, there is no testing. No. OK, so what happens then? Teachers, students, students together with one another, with teachers, they work and through this working, giving feedback, feed forward, that is when learning happens. Learning ha does not happen with 30 minutes of lecture we giving class. Learning happens on the side of the student, in the mind of a student, and we need to just accelerate that process of learner autonomy in education. There is no testing from my perspective anymore, okay? Except for high stake tests like TOEFL, IB, uh, IELTS, uh, I don't know, Pearson or in YUK, YDC, um, these are different because they are not very much classroom, though they should be based on classroom assessment. But right now, I'm talking about what we do in the classroom context that is very, very important. Thank you, Professor. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, thank you once again, Professor Farhadi, for thank this you. enlightening speech. And we are grateful for the time and effort you took to share with uh, share your valuable uh, words with us. Now we, now we should take a break. And after the break, there will be uh, quite interesting uh, panels with uh, our valuable participants, from our valuable participants. Okay. And Thank we are looking so. forward to see you back at uh, Thank you so 12. very much, and have a wonderful day. Bye-bye. Thank you. <laughs>